Hi, it's Graham. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, dedicate this next episode to the memory of Aparna's and my dog, Ui, who left us on September 2nd of this year. And he was one hell of a dog, and we're going to miss him. And he appears acoustically, I believe, in this episode. This coming episode, This coming yeah. episode. He may have actually had a cameo in a previous episode, I'm not sure. In the Thunder episode. So make sure you listen out for him. He's still with us every day, but it would be nice to hear him again. It's not the same without him now, and the squirrels have taken over the garden. That's right. And with impunity. Damn squirrels. Damn squirrels. <laughs> I told you never to talk to me like that. <laughs> Only two people will get this reference. I know. Actually, Robin will. Robin? She loves um, oh, right. the Muppets. Right. Big Muppets fan. So oh, was, you know, I've a monkey a mu- doing a beaker I've impression. got a Muppets question for you. You do? But before we get there, okay. um, I'm here with Dr. Graham Sanders. And I'm here with Dr. Raywat Yunandan. And we need to have a shout out to our affiliate sponsor, uh, Checked, C-H-E-K-D. Check which that. is a company in the USA that offers in-home blood testing. To check it, them out, go to sciencemonkey.ca slash C-H-E-K-D. And also to buy our books, because who doesn't want to read our books, Graham? Many people. But terrorists. Yeah. Terrorists don't want to read our books. <laughs> if you're a good person who doesn't believe in terrorism, you want to read our books. Right. You're either with us or you're against us. Go to sciencemonkey.ca slash Amazon. So uh, this is one of those facts and furious episodes mm-hmm. where we talk about all kinds of fun stuff. Hey, uh, should I tell them a story of, of you offending a Krav Maga guy? Oh, the Krav Maga, yeah. So two episodes ago, um, <laughs> Graham mentioned that he knew a guy who knew Krav Maga who right. was very upset with Graham and hit him in the face. Yes, What, what did. did you do to this poor man, Graham? Well, he was a, a professor of accounting, as I said, at the business school. And uh, I was we were all at a, at a party and sponsored by the business school, but there was a rowdy group of people that were sort of next door at the party uh, bothering everyone. And I'd heard that this guy, in addition to being a professor of accounting in Canada, also does work for Mossad in Israel, and hence knowing Krav Maga. And the word of the street was that he could kill a man with a credit card just by slicing his throat. And so these people were being rowdy, so I pulled out my American Express gold card <laughs> and I handed it to him and said, here, can you take care of these guys? <laughs> And everyone else laughed, but he didn't. And then later he asked me to come to his Krav Maga class. <laughs> and now I know why. He ended up punching me in the face. Speaking of uh, all things Israeli, I actually have a, uh, a relevant question for you. Okay. Because we're doing this, this Facts and Furious episode here. So who declined the role of Israel's second president in 1952? Who was Israel's first president? Uh, was it David Ben-Gurion? Don't know. I don't know. I know Golda Meir is in there somewhere, isn't she? Yeah, I think Ben Gurion was the first president. Okay, who? So this is someone who was elected, or they're just handing out the presidency at this the time? I don't know I, the context, okay. except this individual was approached to see whether he'd be interested in the position. Maybe running for it, right? Yeah, and, and he declined. And he declined. No idea. This is a, a Mel Brooks. No, well, this is Science Monkey. So oh, okay. It's relevant. This is Einstein. Einstein. Yes, yeah, that makes sense. That's correct. It was Einstein. Yeah, there you go. Here we can pause. Well, look who just walked in. We've just been joined by Dr. Aparna Halpe, who will uh, participate in the remainder of this rapid-fire Facts and Furious session. Say hi. <laughs> Not the right kind of doctor. <laughs> <laughs> None, of, None us of us is the right kind of doctor. We're all the poor kind of doctor. Yes. Also, so, we, we, all, we all know the proper verb conjugation agreement for none. Yes. So that proves that we're the wrong Wow. We've been joined by Aparna. We were joined at the hip, apparently. <laughs> this is not a visual medium. People can't oh, okay. see that. The joke is made. So I have a question for you. Can we talk about Muppets earlier? or last, We, we uh, did episode? talk about Muppets. Yes. Are Muppets left-handed or right-handed? Ah. Okay. We can do this. And why? If it's a puppet. Yes. So there's someone in there, and if the person is using their right hand... Would, oh, no, I they use the right learn, hand to do the head yeah, and the facial I, expressions. I would imagine the Muppets would be left-handed. left-handed yeah. That is absolutely right, right and for the right answer. Right. 
for the right reason. That's amazing. I'm so impressed. I mean, good team. <laughs> we know everything we need to know about Muppets. Yeah, that's right. Do we win anything for this? <laughs> my, You're good Muppet. my deep abiding affection, uh, we have which is worth nothing. I'm already taking that for granted. <laughs> it's your turn? Okay, we have to ask you a okay. question. Collectively speaking, mm. human beings have spent longer playing the game World of Warcraft than we have existed <laughs> as a species separate from chimpanzees. So, true or false? Is, is it true or false? That's false. Well, it, it, the key thing is collectively. How many players are there really? Maybe a couple of thousand. Okay, so how many years do you think? The games are around together? Wait, 10, 15, 20 years? Oh, I think World of Warcraft has millions of players. Millions of players? Oh, yeah. Really? It's a hugely popular game. They have entire industries in China that are a bunch oh, of people at computers playing World of Warcraft to gain loot and gold right, and swords so right. they can sell them in the real world that's people. a good point so yeah. let's say there's a million players mm-hmm. um, and the game's been around let's say 10 years yeah um, so that's 10 million years which takes yeah. us well past the human human. well that, that would mean each person's playing for an entire year that's what I'm getting at right yeah. so how many days per year do they right. play yeah well, you're, you're going to say yes. I, I'm, I'm skeptical of the answer, but you're telling me that's true? Well, the answer, it's supposedly six million years. They don't have the math. In fact, there's a link I could go and find it and see if the math checks out. But wow. They claim six million human years collectively has been spent playing that video game. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Pokemon Go may eclipse Sp- it in a couple of years. Spoken by somebody who has not played a single video game in her entire life. So. There you go. I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell whether you're more evolved than us or <laughs> depriving yourself of the great joys of life. Don't feel Do you still deprived. play video games? I play Civilization. Where you get to be weekly. Gandhi? And then after, I play for like three hours, uh-huh. right? As a reward for something. Right. And afterwards, I feel dirty. Yeah. <laughs> because if you play a game in real life, you feel like I've done something. Right. You play a video game and you feel like I've accomplished nothing. nothing yeah. mm-hmm. Move some pixels around. And... Yeah, it's horrible. Mm-hmm. How many uh, vaginas does a kangaroo have? <laughs> I'll let Afi feel that uh, one. A female kangaroo. <laughs> right. I have no idea. The male ones have zero. I, I would assume one at least. <laughs> one at least. <laughs> one at least. Well, half. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Can you have half a vagina? <laughs> a blind, like, a blind vagina, a vagina that doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> there's a condition. I know, about. but uh, I know there's so many jokes there. Yeah, okay, vagina. Right. Like it sounds good like thing a, it's blind. I hate, like to, a hate to see what's coming at it. <laughs> hey. Oh, hey. boom, boom. <laughs> All right, so it's more than one, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't be asking the question. That's right. So now we have to pick a reasonable number of vaginas. I, w- <laughs> I never thought I would say that. <laughs> a reasonable, reasonable number. What is a reasonable number? I think we just found the title of our episode. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So let's go with two. That's, yes. It's actually three. Three, according to this Why website. on earth would you need three vaginas? You need a backup and a backup for the backup. <laughs> there's a tertiary vagina. A ter- tertiary <laughs> vagina. So this, this is not like the duck vagina thing where they... they the actually, dark they, vagina? The duck. The duck, well, the duck, duck vagina. <laughs> Sorry, you know, where, the dark. They, where they, they have a separate vagina, which is a fake vagina. Yeah, that, with, the, which has all sorts of curly cues. So that in they it, yeah. can choose really? what, yeah. which sperm they want, right? Right, because yeah. female ducks are raped, basically. It's yeah. non-consensual sex. So the only consent they can give is... Wait, wait. Do animals give, give consent? Consent? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Stop and ask, are you comfortable with this? <laughs> Every phase. You don't get an enthusiastic verbal response in the affirmative. Stop. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so they can choose which vagina the, the male penis goes up so that they'll be fertilized or not. That's right. The male penis. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the male's penis. Uh, okay. I don't know where else to take that question. Who knows what ducks are doing? You know, uh, some reptiles have two penises. Penis. Yeah, penis. Penis. Yeah, I have a joke Pini. about that. What's the plural of penis? Is it penises. Penis? What, what, is that fourth declension in Latin? Is it penis? It's not, well, it would be P-N- P-N-U-S, oh, right? but it's P-N-I-S, so I don't know if... It, uh, we can find that out, but geeks. <laughs> this is why we're not real doctors. <laughs> Your turn. Not okay, not. Our, our turn. Okay. Uh, this is one for both Appy and you, because mm-hmm. it's, it's a fascinating one to me. A medium sized cumulus cloud. Mm-hmm. How much would that weigh? In Well, first of all, roughly, how much do you think it would weigh? I'll okay, give me, you some clues. Let me work this out. Okay. So, a medium sized cumulus cloud is about the size of a couple of houses. Oh, I, I don't know how they're measuring media. Um, and that would have enough water to fill a few bathtubs, I'm assuming. So I'm going to guess mm-hmm. like 100 pounds. This is saying way more than that. Really? Think elephants, number of elephants. Is that a unit now? Yes, we're using elephants as a unit. 
And of course, that's problematic too, because elephants vary widely in their weight. Yeah, anyway. yes. This is what happens and when you, you get your... And you have uh, to assume that the elef elephants are all sort of liquid. Never having touched one, I can't confirm the What's the analogy to the elephant? Why are we thinking They're probably mostly liquid, right? We all are like 70% water or something. Um, 10 elephants. No, it says here 80 elephants. I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking more long. But how does. Okay, so that must mean a medium sized cumulus cloud is huge. You said two houses. It must be much bigger than that. And in two houses, you could fit approximately. 30 elephants. Sure. But they'd fall out of the sky. But they'd have to be bigger no. than that so that the density is low that they float. Yeah. Right. So it'd have to be the size of several city blocks then. Right. Mm. In order to, if you're dispersing elephants across that. Right. Yeah. Mm. So I guess what we have to know here is what a medium sized cloud. You know, this the problem is I got this backed off of Shutterstock. So that's probably. Not the place to, to go. <laughs> Doctor, <laughs> Doctor said. Well, at least I'm being transparent about my sources. <laughs> okay, here's one for you then. Okay. The, uh, more scientific. Yeah. The Eiffel Tower moves. It does. It sways. Yeah, it sways. It, it but it moves do. in response to what celestial object? It does. It responds to the presence of a celestial object. Well, since you're saying it is a celestial object, I would assume... It's the moon. Mm. No. Working the International Space Station? No. <laughs> hey. <laughs> That's right. That was France's contribution to the European Space Agency. We insist that the space station will always affect the size of the So that leaves the sun. <laughs> yeah, it's the sun. the sun. And how would that work? Ah. Something, I would assume heat? Yeah. So yeah. the heat of the sun causes yeah. the metal of the Eiffel Tower to expand. Tower too, yeah. So it moves up to seven inches away from the sun. Right. At uh, a really? peak temperature. Right. Is that amazing? Oh, that is pretty... Away from the sun. I mean, yeah. But the sun travels through the sky. So it's all constantly going away yeah. from... Yeah. <laughs> Always flinching from the sun. Right. It doesn't have any sunscreen. It's I like assume it's also swaying at the top. That's Eiffel right. Tower. Like the CN Tower sways a lot. Yes. Yeah. Like, I think 20 feet at the very top. Yeah, if it oh didn't, my it would, gosh. It would snap off. Right. It has to sway. I've been I've been near the top as it's wearing. It's to me it's terrifying. Right. I'm afraid of heights anyway. Like, yeah, it's moving. Speaking of tall objects, then, if you took all the Lego bricks ever manufactured oh my God. and clipped them on top of one another, and I'm mm. assuming this is one single yeah. column, how tall would the tower be? That you could make in in kilometers in what? Uh, well, in metaphors. In metaphor, in in, uh, <laughs> in celestial <laughs> objects, comparative objects. Okay, distance to the moon. So we're already talking. Right, so 240,000 miles or so. Uh, yeah, to the moon sounds reasonably. That's a unit I'm talking about. Oh, really? Yeah. Holy crap. More than one <laughs> More moon, than unit? One, yeah. moon unit? Moon unit. Moon unit. Uh, <laughs> I will say six moon units. <laughs> 15 dweezels. <laughs> 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 Only true off a fence will get that joke. Uh, what's your guess? How many times can it reach the moon? We've got 15 moon units over here. Mm. So with strategies, either to guess right under Ray or right over Ray. It's like, let's make a deal. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll be closer. <laughs> I didn't think it would be that much. Okay. So I would, I would have thought more in the, the range of six to seven. Six to seven is ten. Ten, ten. So units. you're closer. Yeah. Interesting. You overbid, sir. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> no moon <laughs> units for you. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the claim to fame of Mad Jack Churchill, a soldier who fought in World War II? Any relation to Winston? Nope. Okay. He, Bourbon? Did Bourbon? he charge some Nazi Similar. machine gun nest and I'll give you a hint. Um, he's the only soldier to kill other people using this particular weapon during World War II. Oh. Bayonet. Close. I did not know. The, I thought the bayonet um, was uh, World, World War One. Yeah. Was it still I around for World probably War Two? So. Probably. Could and probably it. many people were killed by with bayonets. Yeah. I think mm. when you run out of bullets. The longbow. Because wow. he, he actually went into battle with a longbow and a claymore sword, uh, and no he way. would hack down the enemy and, and shoot them with a bow and arrow. That's so that badass! Happens. Wow. But that's one word for it. Mad <laughs> badass, madass. How long did he survive? I think he lived to the end. He survived the war. My goodness. That's amazing. Can you imagine being a German and seeing a guy come at you with a claymore and a bow? <laughs> I'm not sure it counts as a science question, but why not? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's a science question for you. Okay. The human brain, apparently, according to this, and oh, it's via Shutterstock. Oh, well, I'll go for it anyway. Uh, the human brain takes in 11 million bits of information every second. Okay. That sounds like a lot. 11 million bits of information every second. Anyway, how many is it aware of? 
Oh. Oh. I would say... Well, less than half for sure. I would say 5%. Yeah, I would say 10%. Here it says 40 out of 11 million. Oh, yeah? That's a, the 11 million sounds way off to me. But anyway. So, so less than 1% then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And also, but what we have to define well, that is That sounds being, about right, actually. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I think our brains are aware of much more than we're aware of. Yeah. Yes, so exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. Our conscious awareness is just a tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Okay. Here's a one you language types will enjoy uh, <laughs> or not. Uh, in 4 billion years, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in 4 billion years, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, will collide with the Andromeda galaxy and they will form a super galaxy. Astronomers have already named the resulting super galaxy. Uh, Do you know what it's called? What are the two? Milky Way, Milky and, Way Andromeda? and Andromeda? Is it a portmanteau, those names? Unfortunately, it is. It is, okay. The ugliest possible portmanteau. Milk Andromeda? That's right. No. It's milk drama. Oh, no. This is why astronomers should not be naming things. <laughs> By the way, milk gentle drama. listener, the look on a part of his face right now, I wish we could photograph this and put it on the website. Now, a minority I'm call it milk comeda, milk comeda, which is marginally better. The but... an- why don't they call it Andy's Way? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a 1980s like cop drama. And drama. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, actually, there's no good portmanteau for that. They just no. have with the I'm sure in four billion years, whatever's left of us will give it a different name. Right. Thankfully. <laughs> it'll, just be some, it'll be some little tiny box with a consciousness in it. That's what will be left of us. And the noise it'll make will be meep, meep. Yep. Meep, 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 There it is. All right. In 1251, Henry III was given a pet by the King of Norway. Oh. He kept it in the Tower of London on a long chain so that it could swim in the Thames. Here comes Uwe, speaking of pets. Okay, listen, listen, gentle listener, this is the sound of Uwe the dog walking on the, the wooden floor. Oh, poor Uwe. He's, he's an older arthritic dog. He's wondering why we're staring at him. Guys, why are you looking at me? <laughs> so Henry III... Henry III had a pet from the King of Norway. Kept it on a chain long enough so it could swim in the Thames. What was the pet? I'm assuming it's a monkey of some kind. A well, t- think of where it's coming from. Norway. Norway. Yeah, although I guess the king of Norway could get whatever he wanted from anywhere he wanted. He's a king. But... Was it a in person? A, in chains? No. no. Oh, um, hi, Uwe. Hi. Was it something like that? It's actually a, something a... that lives in the same part of the world as, as Uwe. A polar bear. Polar bear, yes. Really? You had a pet polar bear, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Holy 1251, poor thing. Swimming okay. in Thames. Speaking of galaxies, how long does it take for the Earth to rotate, revolve, no, rotate. Oh, rotate. Rotate around, no, hang on, you no, revolve no. around an axis, you rotate around a center point, right? Yes. Okay, rotate around the center of the galaxy. So our solar system, how long does it take to travel yeah. around the center of the galaxy? I probably should know this. I do not. <laughs> Let's guess. Uh, is it revolve or rotate? Hang on. Okay, uh, revolve is going no, around the around, sun, around, rotate around is on the, the axis. Okay, yes, so revolve exactly. around revolve the center the of the sun, galaxy yeah. then. Yes. The galaxy itself is rotating. Mm-hmm. That's right. As it's rotating, our solar system is revolving around the center. That's correct. Um, and I would say it takes 10 million years to do that. Oops. Oops. <laughs> it That's... takes uh, 230 million years. Oh, okay. okay. Which is actually less than I thought it would be. So think about this. So the last time the Earth was where it is now, um, there were the earliest dinosaurs had just arrived, and we didn't yet have flowering plants. That is incredible. Mm. Wow. That is amazing. Which certainly makes you wonder what it will be like when it arrives here again. Well, um, I'll still be here. And be, the cockroaches. Because I, I work out. How much more World of Warcraft do we have to play with? <laughs> to equal revolving around the center of the galaxy. Okay, I've got one for you. And this one I don't believe, although it's not from Shutterstock. It's sourced to something called dogguide.net. Dog guide. Dog guide. Dog guide. Guide, like yeah. guide to dogs. Animals have ecological footprints too, like you know, cows and mm-hmm. so forth. And methane. What is a dog's ecological footprint in terms of a Toyota Land Cruiser? How do they compare? A Toyota Land Cruiser. Land Cruiser, which is like an SUV. A single dog. A single dog. Oh boy, interesting. You know, it's a loaded question. It completely depends on the context in which the dog exists. Right. Mm-hmm. Because a stray dog will have a very low ecological right. footprint. On the other hand, this dog here has an extremely high yeah. ecological footprint because of everything that we put into maintaining him. And, and Driving to get his dog food and stuff. Right. I don't know how comprehensive they're being uh, in terms what, of footprint. What gets what, the, the cost, the ecological cost of producing something like kibble, for right. example. Right. 
uh, all that corn. <laughs> okay, yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm sure because the question is meant to be ironic. Right. I'll say they're equivalent, but I doubt that. I think the dog is much less impacted. Yeah. Much. I would say so too. Here yes. they're saying it's two Toyota Land Cruiser. No. That's nonsense. For I, one that's dog. Not, that's and that doesn't make any sense to me that unless you're taking sense. all these external factors into account and even then even then you're even then. burning gas on right. a Land Cruiser right? I mean they probably haven't done the same amount of math for the Land Cruiser mm. like where does the handle come from from some Singapore made yeah. by right, these yeah, people right. you know yeah. all uh, kinds of ways of doing this oh this is this is BS huh? yeah. so continuing on the theme of galaxies and, and dinosaurs and stuff in the era of the dinosaurs was a day longer shorter or the same length as it is today hmm well Things tend to slow down, right? Mm. So it must have been a shorter day because mm -hmm. Earth was spinning but around faster. I would guess only infinitesimally shorter. Maybe a few minutes. Yeah, actually, you guys are you guys so smart. So the Earth's rotation slows down by 1.4 milliseconds uh, every year, I think. Right. Yeah. So when the dinosaurs were around, a day was about 23 hours, so one hour less. Oh, wow. And so the Earth's um, in, in, in 1820, the Earth's rotation was exactly 24 hours. But it's now off by 2.5 milliseconds. Interesting. Oh, so okay. You can walk around. That's fine. And the, yeah, listener again, that, that tippy tap noise you hear and is the, the dog walking around. Heavy and heavy panting. Heavy panting. <laughs> I think that's what we're talking about. That's okay. That's, that's he's, me. He's part of the show. <laughs> so a million years from now, there will be more than 24 hours in a day. And we can get more stuff done. In fact, um, well, you'll still be around. by then, the <laughs> day may be equivalent to a year. Right. And at that point, the Earth would be tidally locked with the sun. Wow. So right now, Venus, the Venus day oh. is longer than the Venus in the year. Right. That's so cool. Yeah. That'll mess up our calendars, though. <laughs> no more birthdays. Speaking of dinosaurs and fossils and stuff, that actually leads me into... An entry I want to give in the Celestial Emporium of oh, Benevolent Knowledge. Well, insert the theme music here. Yes. Theme music done. <laughs> Was it some sort of mystical orientalist yeah. music or something yeah. completely unrelated? Um, so there was a polymath oh. named Shen Kuo, mm -hmm. who was... Uh, active in the Song Dynasty, so his years of his life were 1031 to 1095 of the Common Era. And he wrote a book called um, Meng Shi Bi Tan, which is uh, Talks with My Brush at Dream Creek. And it's just full of all sorts of observations about a ton of different things. He was kind of like a da Vinci. He just wrote about everything, noticed everything, and uh, had conjectures which were remarkably accurate. Um, and he was really interested in geological um, formations. He actually observed oil in, in China. Um, this is back, let's see, we're talking about over 2,000 years ago, or over, over 1,000 years ago, right? Or about 1,000 years ago. Hello, Uwe. Are you coming <laughs> to hear the Celestial Emporium? He wants okay. to hear, yeah. So I'll read a, a excerpt from it. In the Jirping Rain period, which is 1064 to 1067. The Dripping Rain period? Jirping. <laughs> Jirping Rain. Jirping. Jirping. Jir is to um, enforce or to affect something. Ping is peace. So it's the rain of affecting peace. Yeah. Oh, R-E-I-G-N. R-E-I-G-N. Oh, I thought it was Jirping Rain. rain. Jirping no, no, no. Falling from the sky. <laughs> rain is Jirping. <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, emperors would divide up their, their uh, tenure on the throne into rain periods. And they would give the the rain period a name based on their aspirations. So if they wanted to have peace, they would call it the dripping okay. or whatever. So anyway, that's how we divide up the Chinese calendar is by these rain periods. So from 1064 to 1067, a man of Zhou was digging a well in his garden and unearthed something shaped like a squirming serpent or dragon. He was so frightened by it that he dared not touch it. But after some time, seeing that it did not move, he examined it and found it to be a stone. The ignorant country people smashed it but Zheng Bo Xun, who was a magistrate of Jincheng at the time, got hold of a large piece of it which, with, with scale-like markings that were seen to be exactly like those on a living creature. Thus, a serpent or some kind of marine snake had certainly been turned to stone, as happens with the stone crabs. So he's oh, recognized that it's a fossil. It's a fossil. Yeah, nice. which was kind of cool. And then he had another observation along those lines, which is even more interesting. In recent years, so we're talking about uh, 1080, mm -hmm. there was a landslide on the bank of a large river in Yongningguan near Yanzhou. The bank collapsed, opening a space of several dozens of feet, and under the ground a forest of bamboo shoots was thus revealed. It contained several hundred bamboo with their roots and trunks all complete and all turned to stone. 
Now, bamboos do not grow in Yanzhou. These were several dozens of feet below the present surface of the ground, and we do not know in what dynasty they could possibly have grown. Perhaps in very ancient times the climate was different, so that the place was low, damp, gloomy, and suitable for bamboos. On the Jinhua Shan and Wuzhou, there are stone pine cones and stones formed from peach kernels, stone blush, bulrush roots, stone fishes, crabs, and so on. But as these are all modern native products of that place, people are not very surprised at them. But these petrified bamboos appearing under the ground so deep, though they are not produced in that place today, this is a very strange thing. Mm-hmm. So he understood climate change yes. and understood sedimentary layers, that this was something fossilized when the climate Did was he different. tell anybody? No. He did. He wrote okay. it down. All right, fine. Yeah. <laughs> with, his, with his dream brush. <laughs> no, his, uh, his so talking brush. <laughs> well, ca- covering for shelter from the dripping rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I thought those were interesting. That was cool. Uh, very interesting. Uh, entries into the Celestial Emporium mm-hmm. of Benevolent Knowledge, and we can close the book. <laughs> So do we have any more time? Or are we oh, we have our... some more time. Okay. Uh, I got plenty more questions for you. Sure. Um, where is the most remote sculpture? Ah. Like Easter Island or something maybe. So remote, how do you define remote? The furthest from any human beings? Yeah. Uh, of course we don't know which is sculpture. Take, take a guess. I would guess that it would have to be something either far north in the Arctic or maybe the very remote parts of Chile. I'm going to stick with Easter Island. Excellent guesses. The truth is, the moon. Oh. Ah. A sculpture Who put a sculpture in Yeah, so Astronaut Dave Scott, Scott, Dave Scott Dave Apollo 15, left a 3.5 inch uh, sculpture by uh, sculptor Paul Van Hoydonk. Huh. And it's called The Fallen Astronaut. It's a little aluminum sculpture. Oh, I had never knew that. That's kind of cool, actually. Yeah. I heard another astronaut wrote his daughter's name on the surface yeah, of the that moon. was, um, oh, I forgot his name. Uh, the Last Man of the Moon. The Last Man of the Moon. Yeah. yeah. That's a good name for an album or a novel or something. <laughs> Eugene Cernan. Eugene Cernan left his daughter's name. Yeah. And his, his comment was, it'll, it'll always be there. It'll never blow yeah. away. Until some other astronaut comes along. Yeah, exactly. And steps on shows it. up. <laughs> I, have, I have more questions if you have. I have one more for you. Please. Over the course of your lifetime, how many pounds of skin do you shed? Oh. Oh, I'm assuming that your weight. So I'm going to guess like 200 pounds. Wow. You really shed a lot of skin. Yeah. You're 200 pounds? Sure. <laughs> it's because your BMI is so high <laughs> from all that muscle. Yeah. Is the party going to guess? Uh, Appy actually mm. thinks about these things. Oh, I see. Uh, that's, you have to get a running, running commentary because we're on uh, well, an audio format. I'm, I'm thinking that you probably... Isn't, don't you renew all your cells every seven years? They say that. They yeah. say that? Something yeah. like that? But you're shedding your skin cells, cells constantly. Right? Constantly. Yeah. Unless we bolt mm. like snakes every because seven years. They say that all the dust in your home is from your skin cells, which I don't really buy. No. I bet you a lot of it is. A lot of it, but yeah. no. Uh, you know, quite... Uh, Ui sheds copious amounts of skin dust, which I have to clean and up every fur. single day. Oh, really? So, yeah, I, I would... I would actually say more than that. More than 200 pounds? Yeah. It says you're 40 pounds. 40 pounds? Yeah. 40 so we're not quite as gross as we think we are. Yeah. Hmm. That one I think has a source so, too. Hmm, that's interesting. So that's, so that's about half the weight of, of a small person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How some some gross stuff? Um, okay. What's the longest known separation between twin births? It's not really that gross, I guess. Mm. It's interesting. Because, you know, everyone knows twins. I know yeah. the twins. And sometimes they're a few minutes apart. Yeah, sometimes, right. you know. Longer. Unless they're Siamese twins. A day, a, right. Maybe a day or something? It's probably more than a day. More than a day. More I wonder if the second one was a surprise. They thought they were done. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. That's Having contractions viable. again. Yeah, more than a day. Wow. Were they both viable? Were they both alive? Yeah, both okay. alive. Wow. Uh, so they had birthdays, twins born on separate days. That's kind of cool. Yeah. You have to share the birthday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Were they this identical recent, or this fraternal? Like the last yeah. three years or so. I think they're identical. Okay, let's say a week. 87 days. What? What? 87 days. Wait. So, so she gave birth to one of them. Prematurely. Yeah. Must and be. then 87 days later, the second one came out. Did she know that the second one yeah. was there? Okay. Yeah. So and it was, was it long after the due date, I wonder? I don't know. Because 87 day discrepancy, yeah. one has to be a lot, a lot before so, and one so has you know, to be long one, after. You know, one, one, one twin... Just kick the other one out. Yeah. Okay. I'm staying here for a while. I get to hang out. Yeah, look at all this extra room I've got now. I can do. I can do all sorts of stuff with this place. Redecorate. I want to end on a a, a good one here. So I've got. um, How about a sex? Whatever like sex was, right? Sure. Okay. um, You're talking about a question. (laughs) Okay. In Australia, 
There is a mouse-like creature called an Antichinus. A-N-T-C-H-I-N-U-S. Antichinus. Ah. When does the male stop having sex? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. During one act of coitus or during his lifetime? Or? During the sex mating season. Okay. When does he stop? When he's had enough? No, not when he's had enough. <laughs> when the, when the woman's, the, when the, the female... And you would think so. When the female eats him, <laughs> kills him and eats him. <laughs> he's insatiable. He keeps going until what? Until he dies. He dies. <laughs> but what kills him? Uh, dehydration. He disintegrates. Oh! <laughs> Having so much sex, he disintegrates. Oh my god! So, I have a quote here. Uh, By the end of the mating season, physically disintegrating males may run around frantically searching for last mating opportunities. Oh, wow. By that time, the females are, not surprisingly, avoiding them. Avoiding them. <laughs> <laughs> the females must be in quite a bit of pain, too. Oh my god. That was crazy. <laughs> got no words. Well, it says here that a pig's orgasm lasts for three uh, for thirty minutes. A male pig's orgasm. Which well, is... they gotta get something out of a life yeah. of bacon, you know. That's right. Oh. See, that's why they're such wise, happy creatures. Mm. Until we kill them. Mm. Until. Uh, anyway, on that note, <laughs> that's thirty minutes. That's thirty so, minutes. So uh, this is uh, Monkey Ray and Monkey Graham and the Sri Lankan monkey. Yeah, <laughs> <Not far laughs> <to help it. laughs> Thank you very much.